So Tom, we are just delighted. I could I haven't even gone through half of his CD. I just hit on the things that I I like to talk about with him so often. Today, Tom is going to talk about something he is passionate about, and I've never met Tom when he wasn't passionate. About <laughs> but this he is particularly passionate about, and that is ecotourism. So please welcome Tom. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful life being able to learn from people like Dr. Scott, who's one of the smartest scientists I know. And uh, I tell people that if you're worried about climate, join one of these calls because it's amazing. We haven't even begun to, we haven't scratched the surface on what we're dealing with. And I'm just am thrilled and honored to be here. And I hope this is the beginning of much more collaboration. Uh, we're, we're dealing with a, a diverse, multidisciplinary problem and the area that I've chosen over the last few years to, to really focus on is from a ground level education because the truth is as we talked about the first experience I had with climate change was on Senator Fritz Holling's uh, staff on NOAA subcommittee in 1980 so I guess I can say that if you look up the word failure in the dictionary you probably see my picture right beside it because we really haven't done a whole lot, and there's a lot that needs to be done. So what I can tell you is that in the remaining part of my life, uh, there, it will not be aspirational. It'll be operational. And so while I may not be able to do a lot, what we're doing out in the field and educating, bringing people along, it's going to be doing something. And that, for me, is, is a bit of a pivot because I've spent most of my life in this in conference rooms and court and other places, and now we're simply taking it out in the field. I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity to, to build bridges. Uh, I will leave here and go right to the law school where I'm going to lecture today on the most recent case of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, West Virginia versus EPA, where the, the Supreme Court handed down a, an opinion recently that, um, that struck down what EPA was trying to do with the Clean Power Plan. Um, I don't need to stay back here, do I? There's no fit. Okay. You know, I've got a law degree and I got my PhD through seminary. So if you feel like you showed up in a revival, I apologize. It's the way <laughs> I would say it. Um, in the late 1700s, there was a, a philosopher in Great Britain who, who posed the question that has subsequently gone through a lot of, a lot of uh, scientific debate. When he, when he asked the question, if uh, a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to, to hear it, did it make a sound? And I'm not, I'm not going to get into a lot of metaphysics, but what I can tell you is that's the way I feel about what's going on. We have a tremendous amount of brilliance, and we've made so much progress in natural science. But we're not making a sound. Like People aren't hearing it. We, we have to translate the brilliance of the natural scientific world into social conviction. And it's like, you know, what I talk about in law school here and previously out in, in Charleston is that we don't be a part of the noise. And so there's a lot of noise out there, but there hasn't been a lot of advancement. That some courts have said that we have shed a great deal of heat, but not a lot of light on the subject. So the idea of ecotourism, I am thrilled to be able to teach in the college and our dean. David Cardenas, an Ecuadorian, um, is a brilliant guy who understands the opportunity that we have with ecotourism. Historically, people have come to this idea of, of ecotourism from a hospitality background. But what I'm seeing, and now with various groups that I'm in, is that it's coming from a different direction now. People are very concerned about what's going on in the environment. And so for the students that we have in, in this world of hospitality and tourism, we have a great opportunity to inspire and teach them a little bit. It doesn't take a lot. Uh, whether we're talking about forest fires and what's going on, desertification, sea level rise, just some basic data points. And so we really need to see more collaboration here with the college, uh, HRSM, with the law school, so that we begin to embed 
I wish I had time today to take you through a couple of Supreme Court cases and point some of the language out of there so you can see. Clearly, science isn't embedded in a lot of what's going on. And we, we need to come out of silos because these are very important issues that are impacting us here and around the world. I helped create the Floodwater Commission. I was commander of the guard during Joaquin and I, I'm very familiar with how much the state is now paying for the consequences of amplified global climate change with coastal erosion, sea level rise, flooding coming up, coming into South Carolina through the watersheds in North Carolina. And we have a lot, we have a lot to do. So today I'm going to focus mainly just on tourism, maybe offering a few thoughts. So if you allow me, I'm just going to frame it up with more tourism and then walk through a couple of slides. So tourism, because we're, we're talking about, or my talk today is within the world of tourism, social, cultural, and economic phenomenon. People, academics have spent a lot of time defining what that is, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's travel. It involves overnight stay. Does it here in South Carolina? Some of the most unique ecosystems. I, I say this not to brag, but to give context, I think I'm the only person in history that climbed the seven summits and have dives in every ocean. So I say that only because I've seen a lot in the outdoor. And what we have in South Carolina is as unique and diverse as anywhere in the world. You know, Ecuador is, is the same way. We're now doing a new trail in, in Ecuador, the great uh, naturalist trail. Alexander von Humboldt, an Austrian naturalist, climbed almost to the top of Chimbar Chimborazo, which, by the way, is the highest place on Earth, not Everest. Because of Ecuadorian bulge. And his protege, Charles Darwin, with some familiarity, uh, took his notes when he when he went to the Galapagos. So they have a great deal to talk about there. But we're talking about tourism. Tourism, if I just direct you to that third bullet, and it's it's actually uh, if we just go with six trillion, six trillion dollars. And the rough rule of thumb is about 20% of that is now ecotourism. And it's the fastest growth. And there haven't been a lot of studies on why that's the case, but I can tell you this intuitively because people are worried about it and they want to see things and they're they see they're not getting good information. And so as somebody who's out there literally every day, I came back last night, we're down working on Wayton's Island with a potential conservationist right now, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. We have about three million acres in our 20.5 million in conservation. We have a bill before the legislature to double that to six million, and the governor wants to take it to ten million. And a lot of that is just simply protecting these areas that should have long been protected. It's hard to it's hard to un unpay it's hard to unpay property once it's been within pervious services. So six trillion dollars, twenty percent. This is more than walking around money in Camden, where I'm from. And so how do we tap into that and create informed ecotourism guides and operators? And that's really what gets me very excited. I think there's a huge opportunity. Ecotourism focuses on biodiversity conservation. You make a great point about bringing people into areas. And I, I hear about that introducing diseases, but then we also hear about, uh, I get questioned now because now I'm in this space and people are asking me, you know, are you not, are you not trampling on the very areas that you're trying to protect? And, and so it's, a, it's an incredible balance about how do we get people out there and teach them about it. And it's even more reason why we have to educate these ecotourism operators on what are best practices in one of those areas. I spend a month every year and half the last 10 years in the Galapagos working with those rangers down there on certain issues. So we want to protect and conserve natural resources. And that's embedded in the definition. So we're out there and we're not protecting it. It's not ecotourism. We try to define left and right boundaries to put people into the situation where. So if you're, you're looking for the three academic cornerstones of ecotourism. It's the three E's, education, economics, and ecology. And ethics is embedded in that. Yesterday I spent time in class talking about ethics. And I mentioned my PhD is in ecological uh, theology. And that's a, that's a long conversation. I don't care. Literally, I've spent time examining. It's not just about Christianity, but other, other areas of religion. 
it's, it's very much imbued into how we view nature. Um, John Calvin, for the Christians, you know, a great reformer, said that uh, nature is but a mere reflection of his divinity. And you'll find similar words in, in other religions when we talk about ethics. What, it, what are we trying to do? We tend to approach it on what are the, what are the outcomes for amplified global climate change. But for the average person, there's more reason and we're going to talk about health. The economics, I deal with a lot of people over the years because I've been leading trips now for about 30 to every time. Very passionate environmentalists. They're, they're not always very educated. They just love being outside. That's okay, we can educate them. But they often forget that you got to make a living at it. It has to be sound business. And it's also why I would think that hopefully we could collaborate with the business school. But how do we create viable, sustainable businesses to help people who want to get out there in an informed way deal with the areas and some of the challenges that we're dealing with with the environment? Six principles of ecotourism. And I say this because we get asked about different types of ecotourism. Is hunting ecotourism? The dean today, or if he's not today, he's on his way to the menu, right? I can take you to places in Sub-Saharan Africa where, you know, those that are out there protecting are involved in different types of activity. I know that's offensive to some, but what what is this? It minimizes negative impacts to the environment. It creates an awareness and understanding of an area as natural, and this is vitally important. Just sitting about what I try to say to the ones that I work with, just come up with five or six points. You don't have to become a naturalist. You just have to impart information. And I, I would say as much as I'd love to tell you the places I lead, I know with the floor and the fauna, I have websites you can take a picture. And, I mean, there's all kind of cheat sheets you can use now, but we're trying to feed their mind because what I can tell you and in my experience is that as you take people into the environment, they become much more passionate about protecting the environment. And that's the studies will show that. And it, 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 the trips that I lead are always pointedly bringing people from different backgrounds and different uh, perspectives. The conservation and management of legally protected areas will go into a little bit of that the early and long term participation of local people. This is something that we could spend all day about is as we've gotten involved in projects, big project in Fiji, Ecuador, even here along the Black River, we, we need to be more open to bringing in the anthropology of the local area because we're, we're leading out a very important part of the story. And there are places that we're protecting now in this state that go way beyond the Revolutionary War and ended dealing with Native Americans. And if you don't hear a lot about that, I was in Houston this weekend for a conference and a friend of mine who's Chickasaw got up and said, don't call me an Indian, I'm part of the First Nation. And just how you communicate. And you know what, he's right. And then another lady there said that Christopher Columbus didn't discover anything. We were here for thousands of years. I don't know what you're talking about discovering. We were here, might, might have stumbled upon directing economic and other benefits to local people as you get outside of South Carolina and the United States. But in many areas here, environmental justice sort of weaves its way into this. How are we going to help local communities? Uh, we're working now on a project on the Black River with the mayor of Andrews, trying to stand up a local business. And the truth is, my background, if you looked at it, I've, I've been, the way I've made a living for the most part is as a corporate firm. So I don't, I don't, I don't approach this conversation as opposing smokestacks. I mean, we could talk all day about the needs you have, but we have what we need. Like we, I'm working with communities and say, look, quit going to conferences trying to pull smokestacks. Like you've got some of those beautiful areas in the world right here. What are you doing to uncover that and, and to invite people in? Because there are places. When I was here, this is about as far as you get to the river. West Columbia and Casey, you went across the bridge, and now you, you cross the bridge and you see what ecotourism can do because that development is directly related to that riverwalk. 
And so you begin to see places around the state that have built local economies around the environment. The provision of special opportunities for local people in nature, nature tourism employees to utilize and visit natural areas. We're, we've got a project in Camden now in the Water E. The Water E is why Camden, if you're familiar with our state, is there. And yet for most people, the river has always been something they didn't really even know about. We're doing what we can to pull that in and build a downtown around ecotourism, as we talked about. Six trillion dollars, 20 percent, fastest growing. People are tuned in on this, and there's going to be opportunity. And that opportunity inures to those of us who would love to see that as being maybe a methodology for educating people, creating social conviction, which is at the core of why I come to this conversation. I told the dean, I said, I've got some good friends. Uh, he, he, I guess his email is maybe he ultimately is going to Namibia, or do I just have that totally wrong? Um, there's a, I know there's a tour throughout, but starting with that. South Africa. Zachy Neoman, I did an ecotourism conference in, uh, in the Caprivi area, uh, not far from Zambezi. Zachy is the son of the, the founding president of of um, Namibia. Sam Neoma and Robert Mugabe and Nelson Mandela really were the freedom fighters in, in those three large areas of sub-Saharan. Fosters learning experiences. This you see throughout all of this. It gives you an opportunity to, to teach people. And what the studies have also shown is a demographic for ecotourists. The studies have shown are a little bit more educated, a little bit more fluent. It can become incredible ambassadors to drive and create greater awareness as they go back. And that should be, for those of us involved in this, that's a challenge and an opportunity. We need to be taking advantage of that to teach about some of the issues that are we'll talk about. And I'm here in the College of Health Science, and we're going to talk about that. Gnosis, the Greek noun for knowledge, or Greek noun for knowledge. It's experiential. This is where the word came from. So we're not putting people in the environment to teach them about it. And by the way, this is my classroom in the Galapagos, and I'd love to have a guest like anybody here want to come down, that's going to be the classroom you're going to be on. That's Playa Man across the street from the campus, and there's plenty of shade or sun, whichever you prefer, and this is where I teach uh, for the last decade in March. Um, so we're not really breaking new ground when we talk about putting people in the environment to teach them about it. If we focus on three concurrent goals, biodiversity, conservation, poverty reduction, because some of the greatest places, Charleston, they, you know, when Joe Riley took over, they said that they actually benefited from poverty because nothing had happened in 100 years since the Civil War. It's right there. All they did was dust it off, clean it up, right? And if, if that's true in Charleston, let me take you to Williamsburg County. And some of these areas that I was driving through last night are just gorgeous. And nothing has ever happened. So we have such a huge opportunity in some of the poorest areas of South Carolina through ecotourism and some of the areas that have the highest indices of health problems, right? That we'll get into in a minute to get into these areas and then create business viability. We'll talk about the Black River Project in just a moment. We're going to talk about the benefits of ecotourism, environmental benefits, health benefits, economic benefits. Um, so we talked a little bit about the trees. The Floodwater Commission, it was a 410-page report. It's now part of the statute. The first goal was to create an Office of Resilience, which we did. And the statute says that they need to follow the Floodwater Commission report. And as part of that, we were going to, we broke it down, gave the governor. I keep trying to think, I keep thinking that I've done my job, but I keep being reminded that we're just getting started. So we put in there that we were going to have um, plant a million trees over 10 years. And he said, oh, no, Tomcat, we're going to do a million in one year. So then I started looking for who would give us trees because I've not asked for any money. And I had a company that agreed to give me 3.5 million seeds and about 20,000 saplings. And this is when the dog catches the car. Because I'm like, 
what do you do with three and a half million seeds? So I called the director of the Department of Corrections and I said, by chance, would you be willing to offer good time for anybody that would help me put 3.5 million seeds in cups and in, in packets? And he said he'd be happy to. And we put that many seeds in cups and packets. And I can tell you, the way you put a loblolly seed in a packet like that is like this. One, two, and that went in there. So we used, we were able to use some volunteer labor where the those that were incarcerated were able to get good time. Well, now I got them and what am I going to do with them? So I went to the superintendent of education and we wanted to teach, we wanted to use this as a teaching opportunity. So I was able to get public schools across the state involved in planning. But then we had to have somewhere to plan. So then we had to go back to county council and city and other large landowners and ask can we do this. But at the end of it, it wasn't just about it wasn't just about planting trees, it's about planting ideas. So then we got other academics involved to create materials around this. One tree absorbs, one mature tree absorbs 10,000 gallons of water a year. It sinks one metric ton of carbon over the life of the tree. And so we wanted to put out, why are we doing this? And from the angle that I was approaching, it was on dealing with um, flood water issues. So we began working with a conservation bank and DNR to find those areas that it would be more strategic to plant the trees. It was like every time I thought I had skipped this cat, it got a little bit deeper. So at the end of it, it was a very surgical planting. I contend it's the largest in the world. Ethiopia says they have it, but I think they crop dusted. So I said, well, if that's the standard, I can do 10 million. I can just get some planes and blow these things out the door. So I think in terms of planning, so then you, I had people say, well, not all of them are going to live. I'm like, how oh, you got it? How many do you think are going to live? Because I'll go with whatever that number is. These were live lolly pines which survived across the state. There was a pilot project up at the upstate doing the same thing, and they had 80%. So I said, all right, then we'll go with two and a half million. How about that? We planted a lot of trees, and we got a lot of people involved. But what I can tell you is on these issues, people want good information, and they want an opportunity to volunteer on something that's mean. We're building an artificial reef along the coast. And so there's opportunities to educate, and we try to take advantage of that. We do two cleanups a month. I know there's experts in here. If I get into microplastics and nanoplastics and some of that research, we're putting in now, I think the last estimate is 11 million metric tons of plastic in the ocean every year of petroleum products. And we're beginning to see, we talked about cancer, cancer rates. I, I don't dare ease into that category. I'm going to get over my head in a hurry. But I say all this to say, we took the report to the governor. We thought we had a plan, we thought we were done. And he said, oh no, okay, you gotta go sell this now. So I, I wasn't really sure how to do this. This was just before Christmas. And in January, my son and I went over, we wanted to climb Everest when there wasn't a crowd. And I can tell you, if you go to the Himalayas in January, you will not run into a crowd. There's a very good reason for it. It's cold. People saw the picture and asked me, what's it like diving in Antarctica? And the truth is, it's cold. But I thought I knew what cold was until I was in the Himalayas. And my son dragged me out of the tent one morning. And that's being polite about it, because it's cold. And uh, I said, Thomas, there's got to be a better way to do the seven summits than the Himalayas for winter. And so this started this conversation because the governor wanted us to sell this plan. We talked about the seven summits. So while we were there, we conceived of this idea of creating a trail in South Carolina and every night having a fireside chat to invite people in, groups in to talk about climate. And so this last year, this, this was the third year from July 1 to July 30th, I hiked about 350 miles from Oconee County to Charleston. We wrapped the Tatuga, we kayak the Edison River. And people have asked me, um, you realize it's hot in July. And I said, well, the first 62 years, it's been pretty hot. Uh, but I also know that when we do it in July, people pay attention. The first year, they thought I was a freak, and which was fair. And we just got started. The second year, we began to get more people following us. This year, we had more than 40,000 followers on our social media platform. And we had 
networks, major TV networks embedded. We were in over a million households a night, all 30 nights this last year. So I invite each of you to join us this year, July 1 through July 30, and this coming year, 2023 and 2024, I'm going to turn it around and walk from Charleston to Oconee County because I'm going to walk across the country. We will not make a difference with this issue until we build conviction. We, we've got a moral dilemma because many of the people around the world that are paying the heavy, heaviest price have done the least to do those things that have, that have created the amplification. We need to have more, where is uh, my friend, more education on the climate, on the health side of it. And this was one attempt in South Carolina to bring people in. We use the Palmetto Trail as the, as the backbone, but we've also added the Liberty Trail, which is in South Carolina, for those of you who may not know it, we had more Revolutionary War battles here than the rest of the country combined. Not more than North Carolina, not more than New York, more than all the rest total. We had that many battles in South Carolina, so we've got a, a tremendous opportunity to bring life to some of those important battles here. And we, we stopped there and we've gotten our veteran community very much involved. The economics of this is down in the Ace Basin. So the, the, going back to where I started, the idea is we were going to, to bookend this, this expedition with the Jocassi Gorge on one end and the Ace Basin on the other end, two internationally recognized places and build a trail in between. And that was the Palmetto Trail and the Liberty Trail. It's a high value economic activity when you go into areas. And I know that many of you travel like I have, you see what a difference taking people into these areas and what an opportunity it is. That's obviously Machu Picchu. We'll be leaving to teach the next class for HR uh, SM and on J December 26th, leading another class there. Dean Cardenas uh, started this class, I believe, and taught it last year. And I'm picking it up and, and moving with students. Welcome y'all coming on. We'll be back in the Galapagos in March. Uh, doing the trip that I did for National Geographic in Alaska in May, and then in June in Namibia. And we'd love to have more of our natural scientists involved with these trips. Again, and we're looking at the Congaree National Park. I know many of you probably been there. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on these numbers because I've mentioned them, but the economic opportunity is, is amazing. Where economics and ecology meet, Ride with me to the Black River, and you will see what it can do. We're, we're in one of the, it, I don't know that Williamsburg County is the poorest. It has been. It's one of the poorest and certainly in the top two or three. And we're building an economy now with a very, a very capable new mayor of Andrews, retired as a uh, 06 colonel out of the Army, exceptional guy has gone back home and doing some great things. And there we've got a thousand acre Black River track, 600 acres of old growth, cypress and tupelo. And it's just an absolutely gorgeous place that we're, it's about 75 miles down that river. Um, and it, we've gotten about 14, a little more than $14 million of private investment still collecting that. And this is going to be, I believe, one of the biggest economic drivers in that region. Once it's completed, it's already done that. We conserve the Nature Conservancy and others, Open Space Institute, 47,000 acres along that river. And it's something that I definitely recommend. And it is a classic example of how to bring various stakeholders together and address this. This is Sassafras Mountain. You probably recognize Phil Gaines, who just retired as the director of our state parks. Uh, he's now working with these guys at Dressing Orange up, at, uh, up in the upstate. A great friend has done an amazing job. This is on SC7. They say you can see four states. By the way, uh, that's Mount Everest. <laughs> this is uh, southern Russia. That's the highest summit in, in uh, Europe, and that's the dividing line between Europe and Asia. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a health professional. 
but I can, I hope it's okay if I can just share qualitatively what I've seen with, with autistic students, with, with our vets, with young people and old people that, that deal with obesity. The trips that we lead have changed lives. And I, I would count on scientists to, to maybe build some support for that if it turns out to be valid. But for me, uh, I had a student down the Galapagos who was functioning autistic and was having a very difficult time. And we met, we met, we met. And I asked him what he liked doing, and he, um, he said he liked music. And I said, well, why don't you just write songs? And so over the course of this nearly month-long class, he took the notes from every lecture and wrote a series of songs. And he came alive. While I was there, he began playing in places in the Galapagos for a lot of the tourists that were coming in. Gained some notoriety out there, and he's now out in Southern California. And we captured what we call uh, Echo Rhythm. And now, every year through our nonprofit, we give out an award for musicians that write songs that are driving some of these same messages because I very unapologetically believe that we've got to have a social movement. There has to be social conviction around what brilliant natural scientists are bringing in. And, and addressing that, and that's just one area where I've seen tremendous uh, growth in an individual, awareness of lifestyle choices, getting people out. When you get people over about 13,000, 14,000 feet, they're all ears in terms of how to, how to get themselves in better shape. Um, and it's been, a, it's been an amazing trip. We've summited now about 25 mountains around the world and had an opportunity to deal with a lot of different people integration of these nature-based environments and experiences to attainment of holistic wellness outcomes has been just absolutely remarkable. USDA physiological response is being outside in nature is real and it's measurable. Uh, I would love to work with this college to begin to build a case around that, around just what I see because I realize that's not persuasive in a lot of corners. I can simply say I started I mean, I have a solid 30 years, 30 plus years around the world, and I've seen this over and over again, and I'm, I'm certain that it's a body science waiting to be developed. A bit of physical wellness, being outside in green spaces, supports an active and healthy lifestyle. Mental wellness, there's a lot, of, there's a lot out there on that, and wellness in the community, access to nature. We're project in, in Camden is create a lighted path that's safe, and inviting to the public to get out. And uh, I know that if you have shark scientists here, they don't like that I feed sharks, but that's a shot from, we do we have a shark institute and we, we feed uh, two or three times a year trying to bring awareness. We're killing about 80 million sharks a year now, mostly for fins. Terrible way to die, cut the fin off and throw the shark back so it can, it can drown. And we're simply doing what we can to raise awareness and begin to have people understand that we can that we can live uh, together. We have 402,000 plus veterans in South Carolina. This is a trip to two on the ends of this. This is Denali. Um, we're at about 13, 14,000 there. And uh, this was a trip up there. And it's again, another opportunity. I, I don't really have uh, science that I can add other than my own observations and I've seen the stress, PTSD, and seen how people when you take them out, particularly uh, our veterans and the positive outcome and we lead these trips periodically. These are both 100% disabled, uh, recently retired Green Beret and getting them out there. So we continue to do that. On, this started last last year. MUSC became one of the major sponsors um, of SC7. And they do a year-long event along the path that we've set out, Adventure Out. And they're uh, exercising outdoors, green exercise, and they've found that to be very valuable in dealing with certain population and have begun to assimilate the, the statistics, and they'll be releasing some of that. Research is connected sedentary lifestyles. I mean, this is uh, 
probably not the highest level of science, but it, you know, people sitting around are creating tremendous problems. And we, we've seen it. I've seen live change. Most of we have what we call our adventure program and we lead hikes uh, for six months out of the year, every week. And then once a month into a national park or state park, many of the disadvantaged students that we work with bring their parents are often from single parent households. And we've seen them and their mothers, it's been mothers the ones that we've worked with, lives have changed. They send us, uh, keep us updated on how they're out there. Sedentary lifestyles increase all causes of mortality. This is an area that I would love to work with the college hunting. You know, how do we create stronger nexus? If it's out there, I'd love to have it. Environmental benefits. This is from a peer reviewed study with this idea of exposure to ecotourism fosters that as a direct benefit. That's not an indirect. You put people out in the environment and you're teaching them, they become very passionate about protecting them. The incentive to rehabilitate modified environments, provide funds, uh, assist with habitat maintenance. I've told you that what we do, we teach uh, certified scuba divers. We do three or four classes and the, the only only requirement for that is that you have to help me clean up. We don't charge for that. So every twice a month we do cleanups. We just sponsored the first World Surf League surfing tournament in the Galapagos. We went down to surfers that come in from around the world. Their, their cost for that was that they had to help me do cleanups in the Galapagos. And I, I, was, I don't want to damage your visions of the Galapagos, but I can take you into bays there that are isolated bays that look more like landfills. Because all the garbage that's uh, accumulating there from the from the two currents that, that bring those those plastics from around the world, and it's uh, it's things you just cannot unsee. So the environmental benefits are unlimited in terms of what we can do as we as we teach and unleash these passions. Nepal, this is just above base camp that winter um, on Everest. I use this, but it has created a, a lot of ecological uh, enhancements. It's also created a lot of ecological challenges. Uh, people don't really think about it that don't climb at altitude, but anything you leave this year at about 15,000 or above is going to look just like that next year. So I'll just leave that for you to think about. And, you know, we, we climb now. Seven summits are all blue bag. And if you're on a mountain for three weeks or a month, a blue bag for human waste is usually the heaviest thing you're taking off the mountain. And so there have been years where that wasn't a practice. And so there's lots of opportunities around the world in some of these places. Clearly in, in Nepal, we've done some good social and economic development. Kathmandu is a thriving community, but it's also, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Ecological protection, preservation of authentic. This is my wife and I lead a group every every winter after we go to the Mayo Clinic up to the Boundary Waters, dog sledding and taking people out in some of those in the Boundary Waters, just fantastic, beautiful areas, and we enjoy leading those trips up there. Climate change is the it's the big shadow, it's the big cloud that we're operating under now. Ecotourism. Uh, when I was down at PG last working with. UNEP down there on uh, seabed mining regulations. Uh, we had occasion to, to be there when they were moving some uh, indigenous off of their islands there where they had grown because the island no longer makes it beyond high tide. And uh, sea level rise and, and other issues that we could talk about. This is going to be an area that um, is going to continue to be an issue. One of the Potential investors at the Wadey's Island wanted clear proof. Call me this. If we invest in this, is it going to be still above the water in 30 years? We don't want to invest in places that don't have, that won't make it beyond high tide. In Antarctica, which is where this picture was taken, uh, there's a lot of challenges. We go into diseases. You can get into that. You can get into how do you create balance? How do you create balance in some of these fragile ecosystems if you want to? take people into these areas without destroying what you're there to see. And that will, that will become more and more of an issue. Um, 
I mentioned to you that the governor, um, along with senior legislators here in South Carolina, have introduced the Conservation and Antiquities Act, similar to the Theodore Roosevelt's 1906 Antiquities Act. Where we're going to go from 3 million to 6 million acres protected, and the governor would like to see that number go to 10 million acres. Um, there's going to be even more opportunity for folks to get involved with conservation and conservation projects. So let me stop. We could talk all day. We could take this in any direction that you'd like. Hopefully I've at least maybe tickled your mind, take you places that we can, but I would love to have this just be the start of collaborating on some of these issues. And um, I'm always very eager. I'm, you know, mentioned I've been practicing law a long time. I, my PhD is in theology, but I'm really just a frustrated natural scientist because that's where I started here in Carolina. And I, I moved away from that after going to work with uh, Senator Hollings and went the policy route. So let me say, please comment, question, and also know that I'm, I'm honored to be over here in this college and be a part of this program. As I said, hopefully this is something that we can continue to build on. to them it's not a belief you know it's like do you believe in gravity well <laughs> jump off a building and, and see if it exists uh, you know it's uh, I think more and more people are realizing it's it's hitting them in the face and that's unfortunately it's gotten to that stage but it's uh, I'm, I'm glad to see there are more and more people aware of it yes I agree with that I, I didn't know that I would live long enough would begin to develop a consensus, and it's it's kind of like I'm just a redneck from Kershaw County. It's like a blue collar kind of thing. Where like when your first floor is flooded, you don't. There's no convincing. Like something's going on, right? The people that are out there see this, but at the same time, I'll tell you, somebody who talks about this all over the world. I won't call anybody out, like Oxford, St. Petersburg State. When I'm invited in, I, I like saying thank you for having me come in and talk about climate and greenhouse gases. Which one would you like me to talk about? With people who are informed, and immediately their head goes down. Like if you don't know the six greenhouse gases that the UN is monitoring, you will have a devil of time reducing it. Right? And you may think I'm being facetious with it. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, perfluorocarbon, hydrofluorocarbon, sulfur hexafluoride. Until we get there, we can't talk about global warming potential. We can't talk about the six sources. Energy, industry, transportation, commercial, residential, agricultural. And until we can get the conversation there, we can't really begin to define how we reduce those emissions. And I can tell you that, you know, as an attorney, I've been really, I would say disappointed, but I would say better disgusted, disgusted at the level of the lack of depth that people have on these issues that are making decisions. 
and it directly, I did a paper several years ago, uh, I'll send it to you, Georgetown Environmental Law Review, that talked about did environmental regulation lead health or did health pull environmental regulation along? And throughout all the time, going back to the Greco Roman Empire, it always took health problems to have environmental regulation come to mind because now people are scared. And I don't know that I would go all the way to scared, but there's a lot of concerns that people have about what they're seeing. They have not heard the worst yet. That you, some of the things that, that you cover, it, we're simply talking about kind of baseline issues of houses falling in the water and the, the rivers flooding, and coastal, other types of coastal erosion, sea level rise, King Street in Charleston. The health piece of this, if you look historically, will be the most important piece. Because as people begin to understand the negative health consequences of what they now know is happening, that's going to lead more conviction to change. And so that's why I was excited to be here. Like we, and so what I can tell you, and I'm not speaking for the dean in case he's on here, Dean Cardenas, we now have a whole college that is a piece of which is, is educating people how to go out there, how to be those ambassadors for this information. So let's don't let that tree fall in the forest without people hearing about it. But I do think the health consequences of this historically have been the most important to drive change, whether it was Chernobyl and Fukushima with nuclear issues, right? It wasn't just like, well, let's, let's figure out how to do this better. All of these issues in public policy and law typically follow adverse epidemiological and health impacts. And really figuring out a way to, to knit law, ecotourism, health together puts us in a position of, of leadership. And so let me leave this with you, just for something to think on. And you can send me emails, challenge me, or call me ugly names. Believe it or not, South Carolina is leading the world in reduction of anthropogenic interference. And you're like, no way. And, you might, and then when you see the numbers, you're going to, it's just an accident. It is an accident. We talked about what are the sources when you get to transportation, energy, and industry, you're about 70%, more than 70% there for anthropogenic interference. Here, we're at about, depending on what numbers you look at, 78 million metric tons in South Carolina. That number's a little higher than some others I've seen. We're taking four coal plants off the grid by 2024. Yes, ma'am. Human release of greenhouse gases. So, um, what we're monitoring and the human releases of greenhouse gases, because that's the number we're trying, we're trying to reduce that. The numbers, the most recent numbers I've seen are 78 million metric tons. Those four plants are being replaced with utility scale solar. Utility scale solar, zero emissions. So we're going to reduce by 13 million metric tons by 2024 off that 78 million. The most aggressive aspirational plans were 20% reduction. And so off that, then you might say, well, that's just an accident. Not, not really. You know, I'm I'm in these conversations. But what we're also seeing is that utility scale solar is generating a little over 10 megawatt, and coal is generating a little over 3 cents a megawatt. So it's not only providing, it, reducing our emissions, but we're finding, and this gets to the false narrative, which is you have to choose economic or environmental sustainability. That's the way the public narrative is. And it's not true. What you have to know is what you're talking about. Because today we have technologies that allow us, and we're going to see with distributed power, because now that we, once we crack storage, distributed energy will become much more prevalent. And what do I mean by that? Typical steel mill is generating about 5 million metric tons of carbon, most of that off of energy. So we're going to see energy coming in behind the meter. And you'll have generation in storage. Here in South Carolina, we've begun to roll out an electric highway for refueling for electric vehicles. Why is it? Why are we in a position? Because we don't drill low end gas here. We got a lot of sun and we got wind. And so we have begun to hear 
just to make this point, the more that we lead the world in terms of fast refueling stations, the more we impact and create greater opportunity for manufacturing. Because here, we're making e vehicles with BMW, Volvo, and Mercedes. So these things are not separated. They're concurrent. Yes, ma'am. I feel like I know what Dr. Scott was going to say. <laughs> Where in Newberry, I know he was talking yeah. about it before you had, they have like, a law against solar panels. Yeah, so, it's, it's against the law of Newberry to install solar on rooftop or rooftop. Yeah. And, and the, the reason the city owns solar utilities. Yeah, like the city. And, and so we really need to see some change in that. You know, the cost of solar power is going to be so much higher than it is today. Looks like there's some questions here. Yeah, let's see if we have some questions online. I know uh, Bonnie Ertle made a, a great comment from down in Charleston how much she enjoyed the town exploration. Let's see what else she's got here. Uh, am I doing this I right? really appreciate all yeah. this diverse audience. So good to see AK Light and Ops from Maryland with us today, and so many other folks online here today. Just so glad. Uh, I see Kelly Fleming is online. Kelly will be teaching a new uh, course on climate change next spring. Uh, and so, uh, Kelly, I know you probably got some really good ideas from this today. Bonnie, thank you. Join me. Help me pick up some trash. <laughs> I would love to. Bonnie works with microplastics on the oyster work. Oh, really? Well, I hope that we can get together. Yes, I'll be in contact for sure. All right, since so you said I had one more minute, there was a great. Did somebody else have a question? No, we've got a few more. Oh, I was just going to mention that I'm I'm originally from North Carolina, and for a long time, and it kind of fluctuates with political will, obviously, um, because North Carolina kind of can go either way sometimes. 
but um, we had some really great, I know, tax rebates for solar. And for a while, we're leading the nation in installing uh, home solar, like tax rebates. You know, Duke Energy is kind of the, the monopoly from where I'm from. So they were even giving rebates and, and credits and everything for solar. So I know that there are definitely case studies, you know, out there to support those, you know, and also takes the stress off of these companies who don't want to construct million dollar coal or natural gas or nuclear plants even. So, you know. We have a... We have a, a great opportunity. This maybe is another session. I don't want to keep people longer. Under a federal law, PURPA, if an independent can come in and build a utility scale solar for the avoided cost, what it otherwise cost the utility, co op, et cetera, they, they have to buy the power. And I have a couple of huge clients that will build these things at no cost to the to the how you investor in utility if they can simply sell the power. There's a lot of a lot of things going on in that area and peeling off the advancement of sustainable energy is a conversation we can talk about. Where are you from in North Carolina? Salisbury. Okay. My family's in Boca. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I love that area. It's, 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 it's an area that's now benefiting from the area. Absolutely. All right. No more questions. There's a guy uh, who's an attorney general who went to South Africa back in the 60s and made a famous speech. He said, when a man stands for an ideal or acts to improve a lot of others, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope that when combined with other centers of energy, that ever comes great repair. We need social conviction in this country. We know what's going on. The people in this room, there are people out there worried and they're looking for us for leadership. So let's give it to them. Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks for everybody on the line and for coming today. It's been great having so many folks. And we really appreciate your inspiration and thoughtful voting business. Well, thank you for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.